I think it's time. So, uh, hello everyone. Welcome after the short break. Hope you're in a good mood and ready for the next round of talks. Uh, as you noticed, your track host has changed, but hopefully everything else is fine. So, uh, yeah, we're ready for our next block of talks. Uh, the first of which is a talk from someone who, well, might be one of the most influential Scala FP developers and speakers. Uh, I wanted to introduce him also as a Haskeller, but he told me that he is uh, FPR. <laughs> so let's keep it that way. Uh, on a personal note, I remember seeing his um, talk on the Scala conference last year about classy optics, and it was fabulous. A uh, prolific type level contributor, a book author. Um, his book titled Practical FP in Scala has just come out from LeanPub, is it? Uh, don't forget to check it out. So, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the one and only Gabriel Volpe. Thanks, Martin, for the nice introduction. <laughs> Overwhelming. Um, do you all hear me well? Yeah. Except, oh, cool. Uh, I think I should just share my screen now. That would be great. Uh, here we go. Um, Oh, by the way, uh, Gabriel doesn't mind answering his questions during his talk. Uh, so please type them in the QA chat and, well, I'll be conveying them to him. Well, so like, are the slides visible in myself as well for everyone? Well, I can speak only for myself, but yeah, I can see your slides. <laughs> fine. And okay. your face. Uh, and also the people on chat are typing that sounds great. So. I think perfect, that's perfect. That's 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 good. Um, I think I just froze myself. Okay, um, I'm gonna get started then. Um, uh, yeah, that's it. Like for me, it freezes the the video uh, once in a while. I hope I hope it's not freezing for the rest of you. Um, anyway, let's roll. Uh, my name is Gabriel and. I'm here to talk about types and you know as as an uh, as a functional programming lover we grow to love uh, referential transparency functional effects and so on and you know immutable data structures um, but sometimes we always we overlook uh, how our functions and data types are defined you know we have we may see some functions that are that are weakly typed so this is what this talk uh, means to address today and we're gonna get into the validation lands as well so let's see let's see what how, how we, we can get there and um, first a few a few words about myself very quickly I'm a, recently started working at chat roulette and we are doing pure FP Scala so if you're interested uh, in knowing more about it I'll be happy to talk to you and uh, we are hiring in Switzerland and uh, I just published this book recently, and I'm a maintainer and a contributor to a variety of open source projects. Um, let's get started. Uh, I have this um, this function, this show name that takes three arguments: username, name, and email, and they are all types uh, of type string, right? Um, so we can see there; uh, it's very easy to to confuse or to mistake the, the order of the arguments because they are all of the same type. Um, not only we can confuse the order of the arguments, but we can also pass invalid data. It's very easy because we have a function that is very weakly typed. We, like it's all strings, right? So we can see how we, we are using it and we pass any strings is valid. So if we see a function like this, you know, doesn't matter how how much referential transparency and functional effects we have, but this, this is something that we should definitely improve. And something that that comes to mind when, when we have this kind of functions is probably introducing value classes. This is very standard in Scala and basically define a case class for every, every single type and extend any val, which the Scala compiler will try to optimize to avoid Box, boxing at, at runtime every time it can and but not, not always right so it optimizes to avoid boxing but there are a lot of caveats that you can read in the documentation of any file but this is already an improvement over our previous 
function that took all, all only strings, right? So at least we have three different types, so we cannot mistake the order of our arguments. Um, but we can still create invalid data because there is no no validation whatsoever in 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 our apply method. Um, so one we we improved a little bit, but one way we can improve keep on improving this is probably intro, uh, making our apply constructor of the case class private and introduce smart constructors. So smart constructors are normally just functions that take a raw input, in this case a string, and return some kind of validated type in a container. This container in this case is option, but it could be either validated or any other, any other types. I just chose option and I did some very simple validation uh, for the sake of this presentation, didn't want it to make it so long. So we are saying that a username and a name, it's just any string that it's non-empty. So if if the condition uh, is good, then we return that value wrapped in, a, in an option, in a sum. Otherwise, we return none. And for the email, we say that any string that contains the add symbol is valid. Let's pretend that that, that is correct, but you know, we can always refine our rules, our validation rules right here, and it'll be fine. There's only one place. So then we can proceed to use, uh, combine all these smart constructors and, and create valid data uh, to pass to our function. Right? So we can see in this case, a uh, username and name, it's valid, they are valid, but email is invalid. And we when, when we run this 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 application we get this invalid email exception um so yeah well we achieved something we have uh, validation and we have we can confuse the order of the arguments uh, but there's this this thing that case classes have which is the copy method uh, we can do all the validation, do this parmap n, which gives us access to, to all these already validated case classes, username, name, and email. And then we can overwrite the value using uh, the underlying value using uh, copy method. Mm. So this is not nice, right? Um, of course, like if you see this kind of code, uh, it, it shouldn't pass a code review probably, but there's, you know, there's something wrong about allowing the users to do this. Um, so we can try to avoid that. And there is one trick in Scala called seal abstract case class, which uh, removes the private, the, the public constructor, the public apply of case classes, and it also removes the copy method. Uh, there's, yeah, it takes four keywords, seal abstract case class. So it's quite verbose just to define a wrapper. And then we need to define a companion object with a, a, a function inside or a method in this call I just in this case I call it apply but you can call it anything else and it does the validation there so the apply method in this case it replaces our smart constructor so it acts as a smart constructor basically and we can do the same for for email and for name and it's the same and this is how we use it right so we call the apply method uh, we could use parmap n or tuple or any combination some of all I forgot to mention, but I'm using all these uh, extension methods that come from type classes, extensions from, from CATS, from the CATS library. Uh, there's different ways you can combine them, just showcasing a few, a few of them. So if we get all, all our inputs validated and that there is no way we can cheat here because we don't have access to the, to the apply function of the, of the, I mean, to the apply um method of the case class um, that actually returns a username or a name and the apply actually returns an option so that's not what we're looking for so we cannot cheat there and there is no copy method we could use so this actually solves all all of our issues and so far we've only been using vanilla scala so there's no third-party libraries so i think this is a, a good approach if you don't want to use any libraries there's a few downsides with this approach, but uh, the first one is like, as you can see on the screen, we only define two types here because we skipped the definition of name and it's quite ver verbose, right? So it takes four keywords to define a wrapper plus the companion object with the smart constructor. So it's quite a lot of boilerplate and normally in a 
medium sized application you, you get a lot you have a lot of types and data types so this gets very very verbose quite quickly and the other thing that we lost is this optimization of of boxing at runtime that any val provides uh, so like all all of our wrappers are going to be boxed at runtime which you know implies some performance hit and so these are these are two downsides of using this trick but at least it it, it avoids um passing invalid data to our functions and so that that's that's a, a great advantage compared to our first function that took just three different arguments of type string right um but since since there are a few downsides here and we don't want to be writing all this boilerplate let's let's see uh what else we can do what what else is out there in this space that could help us and that that means involving third-party libraries not only vanilla scala uh, one of these libraries is called scala new type which provides this new type annotation and it operates over case classes of a single value um, and it, they, they provide zero cost wrappers it basically guarantees that there any value that is being wrapped is not gonna box at runtime so we have this function now that it uses all this uh, uh, these new types that we just defined and then we can invoke our function and as you can see we can pass any string in the apply constructor because the apply constructor is public and so there's no validation of any sort here um, we could still create smart constructors as we've done before and for uh, these new types and use all these <coughs> Uh, smart constructors to, to validate our data and then invoke our function and there is no copy method here even though we are using case classes the new type annotation is actually a macro that generates a different companion object which actually avoids this boxing at runtime and it actually doesn't have the copy method there's no no way we can cheat here but we still have access to the apply method because it's, it's public and it is not possible to make it private when we use new type so we're probably trying to solve a validation problem using the wrong library because new types is only a zero cost wrapper just provides new types that have no runtime cost uh, it is not a validation library so uh, maybe we, we've been looking at the at the wrong library for our problem and it's great that we can have zero cost wrappers but yeah we still didn't solve our validation issue but there's another great library in the ecosystem called refine which actually provides refinement types and all our validation rules or so-called predicates can be defined at the type level so all the smart constructors we have defined before we can just do it in one line basically we define a type alias username r just for refine we'd say that it's not an empty string. Same for name and for email, it's any string that contains the at symbol. This is using literal types. Uh, and that's it. This is our, all our rules defined at the type level. And I think this is great um, because it reduces the huge amount of boilerplate of writing smart constructors. And this is how we can use it. We have three different uh, arguments again using refinement types. And we can see the username and name are valid but the email doesn't contain the at symbol. And so what happens? Well, we get a compilation error, right? So we didn't have to run our application to find out that our email was invalid. We just got a compilation error. And this is great. Whenever we know our input values at compile time, there is no need for us to run the application to find out that there is, a, there is an invalid data in our functions. So this is one of the benefits that come out of the box with refined. But most of the time what we're doing we are validating data that comes from other services or that come from a web form in some kind of like a user input from a web form for example and so we have to validate data at runtime most of the time not at compile time and you can do that with refine too uh, refine provides this refine v uh, function so i just defined this case class my type which contains an, a non-empty string and an integer that was refined to be greater than five. You can do that with uh, with 
uh, refinement types. And then I have a function called validate, which takes the, the raw inputs, the raw string, the raw integer. And I call this refine v functions, the type parameter that you can see in the square brackets, it's the predicate. And then it, it takes the, the raw argument. Um, so this refine v function, it's more or less defined, it has this shape. Uh, it returns an either of, of a left with the string error or a right of the refinement type. So one if it all well, yeah. One of our attendees is asking, is new type kind of similar to opaque type in Scala 3? Uh, yes, actually opaque types are gonna replace new type uh, more or less, uh, but uh, I haven't explored too much uh, Dotty or Scala 3, it's always changing. So I don't know exactly if all the features are gonna be replaced, but as far as I know, yes, opaque types are gonna replace new types. But for now in Scala, in Scala 2 land, uh, new types is our go-to solution. Um, so we have this uh, refine v function, which returns an either of the string with the error or of refinement type. If it all went well, then it will give us this my type, uh, an instance of my type. So if I invoke this function, which with, with two in, invalid inputs, an empty string and a number four, we get a left of the first error. And this happens because we are using the either monad. Remember the monadic sequences are, are that monads are sequential by definition. So um, it, it short circuits as soon as it finds an error. So we, we got to validate the first non-empty string and it didn't pass. So it just returned the left. We didn't get to validate the second input. But it would be nice if we could just validate all of our inputs at, at, one, go, at, at one go, right? And let the user know all the, all the invalid parameters. And we can do that if we use validated instead of either, which actually goes and has a different applicative instances, which allows you to accumulate errors and run the validation in parallel. But we don't actually need to convert to validated explicitly. We can do that implicitly using the parallel type class. So if we use any of any combination of these par map met par par methods, like they have prefix par for parallel. For example, I'm using par map n here and refine v returns an either. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna convert both either's to validated. It. It's gonna run the validation in parallel using the applicative inst instance of validated. And once it's done, it will convert back to either. And if it all went well, it will give us our type or the combination of the errors. So if we run it with the same input, uh, we can see that now we got a concatenation of the two errors. So both inputs were validated in parallel and we got an error. Um, and this is nice. This is nice. We got, a, but it, you know, getting, getting a concatenation in one single string of the, of the, of all the errors, it's not super clear where one error ends and where the other begins. So you could probably just return a list of the errors that we can display in a nicer way. And we can do that instead of using validated, using uh, validated non-empty list, validated null. Um, in, again, instead of converting uh, directly to validated, we use the power of the parallel type class, uh, which is actually implicitly converting to validated null and then coming back. So we have to convert only our either type to either null, which is a, a type alias for either of non-empty list of string and my type. So if we run it, Again, with our invalid inputs, this is what we get. And this is really cool. Um, by the way, there's also either any EC for non-empty chain. Uh, it's up to you which one you want, you want to use. Uh, chain is actually great for appending operations. But yeah, I think this is very nice that we can do this sort of validation and use refinement types to define our validation rules at the type level and combine it with cuts, which provides this parallel type class and all these niceties of, you know, running in parallel of our validation. It's super cool. So keep this in mind. Um, Bert uh, Madurell is asking now yeah. uh, that we're repeating, the, uh, we're repeating the type twice in the case class and the validation. Is there a way 
uh, he's wondering to not do that and to not have the boilerplate of specifying the type every time at the same time. Uh, not that I know of, to be honest. So that is a good question. Um, I think you take a, a raw type of it's a type string, and you need to tell Refine how you want to validate that. Uh, I don't know if it could be inferred from the return type. Uh, I don't think there's there's something for that, but uh, it probably I don't know enough, and, and it probably is a good question for the Gitter channel of Refine. Uh, but uh, to be honest, uh, I don't know. Yeah. So we can discuss more later. Um, sure. Anyway, another question? No. That's all for now. Okay, uh, let's move on. Keep in mind that this kind of validation we are doing here. Um, I showed already a few predicates that we could use, but there is many more, like the logical, numeric, and full-level predicates that come out of the box with the refined library. You can explore its API and just use, make use of all of them, or you can also define your custom predicates, and it's it's easy to define your own as well. Um, but I'm just not going to show that here. We're going to see a few more examples. Um, <clears throat> this is the, the the final aim of my talk. And this is uh, using new types and refine together. It's something that I've been embracing for a while. And I also recommend it in chapter two of my book. And why is that? Because uh, you know, refine already provides all this sort of validation and type, type safety that we need. So wh why do we need new types? And the, to, in order to, you know, to put a, an example, we, let's say we have this username and name, which are two different types, but they share the validation rules. We can, like in, in our case, a username and a name, it's any non-empty string. So the validation rules are the same. So if we have a function that takes these two parameters, then we get into the same trouble again that it's easy to confuse the order of the arguments because the, the types are the same, basically, but they shouldn't be the same. So this is a case where adding uh, a new type over our refinement types makes sense. And remember, new types are just zero cost wrappers. So it doesn't represent, uh, it is very optimized. So, so their value, the runtime representation is our, our refinement type. So there is no, no performance hits here. And, and we are still using validation rules uh, using uh, refine the refine library, so I think this is a very valid use case, and and it actually gives us very strongly typed functions. So if we if we see at this final example, we have our final show name function, which takes these new types of refinement types. There's no way we can cheat here because there's no way we can com confuse the order of the arguments, and then we cannot create invalid data because the 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 arguments uh, are refinement types, like the what 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 it's inside their new types. Um, so we cannot cheat here, and but I, yeah, this is a a validation at compile time. We normally do runtime runtime validation, and we can see again how how we do that um, using new types and refine because it, it gets a little bit verbose. Um, we basically convert to either, we call this refine v method with our uh, our non, our predicate uh, and, and the raw string. And we call, we convert it to either nil and then we map it to our new type, right? So look, it looks a little bit ver verbose, but this is uh, something that that it's probably, there is a pattern here, right? We are doing this three times so we can probably extract this out and uh, generate some nicer function um, which makes this shorter. And I wrote this validate function, which takes a, a new type and a predicate and and the raw value as the input. And it actually does the same. It actually take, convert it to either nil and it maps it to the new type uh, after refining the, 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 the raw value. And this is how it's defined. And basically it makes use of uh, refined type classes and new type, type, type classes. This coercible is for uh, defined for any new type. And we can see that we convert um, to a new type in the last map call using this coerce method, which it's given by the coercible type class. So that's it. That's that's all 
that's all we had to do in order to define this. Um, so we, we validated our our inputs and, and we used new types and refinement types. So overall, I think this is a, a very powerful combination and uh, definitely recommend it. So to summarize what we, we've just seen, uh, new types are only for zero cost wrappers, right? We can define, it replaces any value, value classes or uh, of any sort and refine helped us with validation and uh, defining all these validation rules called predicates at the type level. And by using the cats library, we can use all the niceties of the parallel type class and either null conversion to, to validate it and so on. So we remove the boilerplate, the, the smart constructors. Uh, whenever we know the values at compile time, that we get compile time validation. So the final result is we get strongly typed functions. There's no more string, stringly functions around. And I think this is, this is awesome that we all should, should aim for this. So I hope I, I convince you this is a, a good way to do validation and to have very strongly typed functions. Um, so that's all I had to say. Um, be happy to take any, any questions. And uh, just Thank one more thing. Much. One more thing. I'll, I'll, be giving a similar, <laughs> I'll be giving a similar talk on Thursday at the Functional Tree City here in Poland. It's also a, an online, online event. It is a very similar talk, but it's, in a, it's a Haskell talk. It's a, so you're all invited to shine as well. Even Thanks. better. Thank you. For Here, you see that there is an implicit validate there of T and P. And if you define your own validate instance, then you can customize the error messages. All right.